the world most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Right Honorable Sir Oliver Franks, British Ambassador to the United States. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Sir Oliver, on our chronoscope show, we've had a number of visitors from Britain recently, and we've discussed our mutual problems in the world. Tonight, sir, since you are a distinguished educator as well as ambassador to this country, we'd appreciate some of your views on the mutual problems of the English-speaking people in the world. Now today, I believe you'll agree, is a rather harassed period for us. And uh, I wonder if you think, as has been charged, that Perhaps we English-speaking people are losing some of our vitality in the world, some of our ability to stay in command of the situation. Well, no, I don't think so. It seems to me that in the last few years, our countries have demonstrated, beyond all possible doubt, that we haven't lost any of our vitality and that we've got all our old grip. I myself don't feel any doubts or hesitations that we'll be able to do what's necessary if it should be required in the future. Are we producing leaders today as, as our forebears did? Uh, Cromwell, for instance? We're always told <coughs> that back in the past there were great men. But what I think is this. I know of no great crisis in my country. I believe the same holds for yours. Of no great crisis when we haven't produced a great man to meet it. I think we'll do that in the future too. Well, sir, uh, when our people look at some of our leaders today, oh, like Truman and Attlee, for instance, uh, they look a bit anemic compared to some of the great men of the past, like Lincoln and Disraeli and Gladstone. Do you really think that we are producing the, the, the capacity of leadership that we produced during the 19th century, for instance? I don't think that I can argue about these differences of perspective, but I don't doubt our ability to produce leadership when and where it's wanted. Specifically, sir, during the, for some 300 years, uh, the English-speaking people protected the human procession from the Napoleons and the Hitlers and the men who would have enslaved it. And uh, Britain uh, took the Russian barbarians and opposed them for many, many years. And while they marched across the map of Europe, the Russians never got to warm water. Now, do you think today that uh, we have the vitality and the strength to deal with the Russian crisis? I think that already in the last 18 months, we've taken measures and we're beginning to give effect to them, which have begun to alter the balance of things in the world. I think we're already on the right road and that if we're willing to proceed along it, keep our resolution, not lose our heads, we stand a very good chance of coming out all right. Do you think this newfound resolution, this newfound uh, uh, change in the pace of the English-speaking people, particularly the people in Britain, uh, has anything to do with the uh, recent change in government in Britain? I think that's a question which you'd find answered differently by a great many different people in Britain, because we in our country, as you in yours, have two great parties, and the answers tend to go according to the parties. <laughs> Well, sir, now I believe that you, uh, some of your ancestors were Congregationalists, were they not? And I believe you're a Congregationalist yourself. That's quite true. And my father was a Congregational minister. So was my grandfather. 
Uh, you regard yourself as a churchman. I mean, uh, you are a congregationalist, too. Oh, I yes, say. I'm a congregationalist, too. Well, now, uh, that was a rather stern creed. That creed uh, placed a lot of responsibility on individuals. There was a lot of emphasis on uh, being instead of on having, and on duty and not on rights. Now, sir, do you think that the people of Britain and perhaps in America, that we are no longer willing to subscribe to those stern creeds that made our fathers strong? I think that the people of Britain, whenever they're clear that there's a job to be done, are perfectly prepared to rise up and do it. And in our very recent history, I think there's very clear proof of that. You I don't have any worries on that score. You are not concerned about a spiritual decline in our, in our two countries? No, I am not. And I'll give you one particular piece of evidence. Before I came out here as ambassador, I was head of my college in Oxford University for two years. And at that time, we got 300 students there, nearly all of them veterans from the war. I've never had so steady, so hard-working, so intelligent, so well-behaved a student body. And they knew what they were doing. And they were confident that when they went out into the world, they'd do a job for themselves and for their country. They were as good as any people we'd ever had. And my college has 600 years of history. Speaking of uh, Oxford and your 600 years, Sir Oliver, is the old school tie what it used to be in Britain? Uh, does it still, uh, well, Oxford and Cambridge, do they still rank where they always did uh, culturally and in society and in politics? Or has a uh, change in, uh, uh, well, let's be frank, the socialistic trend of both our governments brought about a change in, in that atmosphere, that heredity? I don't know quite what the answer is to that question. I think I'd say this. I think Oxford and Cambridge are both much what they've always been. But one of the things that is important and encouraging in Britain is that over the last decade, the newer universities have been steadily coming up, improving in quality, and now today they have their own traditions and their own performance. And we people, who were students at Oxford or at Cambridge, are very glad to see that happening. You are a distinguished uh, educationist, of course, sir. Here in America, we felt that there was some criticism on a recent show. Mr. Felix Morley was here. And we've thought that there's been considerable criticism of American teachers in the last 20 years for lodging uh, too much faith in Moscow. Uh, has there been uh, a similar, uh, is, is there reason for criticism in Britain on the same grounds? Well, no, I don't think I know. I don't think there is. I've not come across it myself. You, have, you don't have the disillusionment among teachers in Britain today over what's happened in, in Russia, over, the Mos over what's happened in Moscow. I don't think that there's disillusionment in Britain about what's happened in Moscow. I think we are much more concerned to make our own way in the world and to complete our recovery. Have and you? we are not worrying all that much. Have you had such things as, as loyalty oaths at Oxford and, Oxford and Cambridge? Has there been uh, a discharge of professors because they were members of the Communist Party? None of these things. No, we haven't had any of that. Do you feel they're necessary at Oxford, which you know? No, I don't. Now, you mentioned uh, your experience with young men in Britain and the fact that you uh, lodged some hope in them. Uh, is there a feeling among young men in Britain today that there's been a decline in opportunity for young men there? Well, it's always a rash thing to guess for a younger generation than oneself. But my guess is that they don't feel that. There are plenty of jobs waiting for them. There are good careers open to them. There's plenty of employment in the country. And yeah. I think they go out into it cheerfully and with a good confidence. Do the young men feel that there is a sufficient incentive? Of course, you, you can't accumulate wealth as our ancestors did. Uh, do they feel that the, uh, not opportunity, but incentive is there? I think that they feel that there are things that they want to do and that they can get on. Particularly, I suppose, in the scientific fields. Yes, and not only in them. Though I think it's true that in the sciences, more particularly in basic research, mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work and achieved some very surprising results. Well, now, on education, sir, do you feel that there's being too much emphasis placed on technological training 
in the British ex education system today? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, we've always had, in Britain, a strong tradition in the arts. And I think you'd find that in the years immediately after the war, a good many people felt that it was time that more emphasis was placed on technology. And I believe the number of students taking technological courses has something like doubled. Uh, <coughs> well, now, on, on that, sir, was there a feeling that Britain uh, uh, had to manufacture more and that you had to become more material-minded than you had been before? Was, is there a trend toward materialism in Britain today? Well, now, taking the two questions that you've just asked me, my answer to the first is yes and the second no. We did feel that we got to manufacture more and our production's gone up by, I think, 45% in the last five years in volume and our exports have gone up. That's something that we just had to do because we have to earn our living, we have to pay our way. But it's not true that that just means a more materialist outlook because, after all, uh, the object, the effort that we're making isn't a material one. It's the survival and the success and the prosperity of our own country. Has this affected Britain's <coughs> culture uh, in any way? Uh, the culture which has been so important to the English-speaking people? It's very difficult, I think, to take a period like three years or six years and project it forwards or backwards and say what its influence or difference in culture is. But I'd say no. Sir Oliver, you've brought our audience uh, <coughs> a message of hope tonight. I believe what you're saying is that you think that we are going to be able to survive the present pressures against us and we'll be able to turn back the modern barbarians and we can look forward, hopefully. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Donald R. Rogers and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guests, was the Right Honorable Sir Oliver Franks, British Ambassador to the United States. It's with great pleasure that we announce that Longines has been honored by appointment as exclusive official watch for the Olympic Winter Games, February 14th to 25th at Oslo in Norway. Now this is the most exacting of all sports timing assignments, for every major event is after all a contest of a man against a watch. This is an assignment which Longines undertakes with great confidence for the accuracy of Longines watches like this Longines Olympic timer and the accuracy of all types of Longines watches has been demonstrated by the most exacting observatory accuracy trials. So to you who own a Longines watch and to you who hope to own one, the exciting Winter Olympic Games at Oslo will take on a new meaning for their time with your watch, Longines. And no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, exclusive official watch for the 1952 Olympic Winter Games. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Wetnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.